Hi, everybody. Welcome to Huddle Time with Ronit. It's Monday, and this time we're starting a little bit earlier uh, because, um, because we're trying to see what's a great time for all of you to join us. So I'm really excited for you guys to join us. Uh, today we have, as, as every Monday, we bring in some really special, incredible uh, people to the show. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited to have my friend, Andrew Carruthers, and I'm going to butcher his name, I know, but uh, I'm excited to have my friend um, join us today. Now, a while ago, uh, which about four weeks ago, I texted him uh, a message and I say, hey, my new friend, and he texts me back and he says, no, we're not new friends. We've been friends for a long time. I think you've been my oldest friend. So I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. So I can't wait to share him with you guys. But before that, I just wanted to say hello to anybody who's joining us from wherever you're joining us. Uh, welcome to Huddle Time with Ronit. Uh, we are a show teaming up with American Beauty Show by Cosmetologist Chicago. Uh, each Monday for a session of helpful, inspirational, but actually a lot of great actions and tips bringing to you so you can create a better lifestyle for yourself. How can you create a better company for yourself, a better career for yourself? The whole point of this session is to help you maximize your time, optimize and leverage your profitability, and how and give you tips of how you can create the life that you actually want in this amazing beauty industry. So uh, for anybody who does not know me, I'm, uh, I'm a wealth and uh, business strategist coach. Uh, we, I found Salon Cadence Academy, which is a high-end uh, coaching and training company for, that helps any licensed beautician, salon owners, spa owners create more time, more wealth in their company so they can achieve the lifestyle that they want. So um, a couple of housekeeping uh, items that I want to share with you. As you know, uh, in um, November 16th, we're going to launch America's Beauty Brunch. This event is all about nurturing the soul, the spirit, the, wall, the, the wallet, yes, wallet, of women in beauty. This is really specifically talked to you guys, but everybody should tune in. We're going to have a live event, a live digital event with special guests like Pepper Schwartz, Christina Setheyer, and Nicole Patterson. And we're going to talk about wallets. We're going to talk about spirituality. We're going to talk about what you need to know about developing great relationships. Tickets are going to go on sale very, very soon. Look at it a day or two. So we'll be sending uh, tickets. I think they're $49.99. But if you're a member of ABS, these tickets are complimentary. Now, members, join us because we are going to have some amazing events coming up your way. Also, if any one of you have not signed up with Data Driven by Salon today, please sign up. They have a phenomenal business tips for the next uh, three weeks, whatever there is left in October. Sign up, go to their website, and sign up for Data Driven which is everything you need to know as a salon owner, as a business owner, uh, a lot of great tips with a lot of great people around their industry. Now, this week, obviously, we're welcoming my very good friend, Andrew Crotters. Andrew is a life coach for his own enterprise. Is you know The name of his enterprise, and I might be you know, butchering it up a little bit, but let me try this. He is a journalist. Journalist, it's it's a it's a whole different concept of life coaching or a business coaching, and we'll talk about why he called um, his website the way he did. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can develop an extraordinary coaching culture in your company. What does it take to become a great teacher, a great coach? Um, but there's a lot more to Andrew than uh, how he got to be that type of a coach. Andrew has spent over 21 years in this in our beautiful industry, and probably all of you 
uh, that listening to us, they know Andrew very well. He's been, uh, an, he started his uh, career as an apprentice, just like you, just like I, and he developed to become an, an extraordinary uh, teacher, extraordinary coach. He's a lifestyle or, or, or a lifetime student. Uh, he's been a director of education for Paul Mitchell Schools and lately at Sam Villa's uh, director of education for Sam Villa Brand. So I can't wait to share his extraordinary knowledge and teaching us how to become better teachers, better coaches, better communicator, and how to upgrade our life. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, guys. It's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, how did you like my introduction? Did I screw up some names or, or some bit here and there titles? You said them just fine. We can we can clarify. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. So, Andrew, tell us, tell the world uh, of our beauty industry, uh, what are you doing these days? Well, I, I am still the education director for Sam Via, so I still do lots of hair education. Pretty much, we have three days of education every single week. We have mannequin Mondays, we have Transformation Tuesdays, and then Runny, you know very well that we do Wellness Wednesday, which is kind of my my passion project on our channel, which is really focused on uh, helping people anywhere from mindset, physical health, even spiritual health. Um, we've started to dive into some more business type uh, content with you last, uh, we, we had uh, Steve Gomez on last week, and so we're, we're starting to dive into some of that kind of content too. But I also have my own coaching company, and it's called The Journeyist. And <laughs> the reason that we called it The Journeyist, my friend Brandon, who uh, um, he's a graphic artist and great with branding, we sat down and we're like, okay, well, let's c come up with a name for the coaching business. Because I just thought it was kind of boring to just call it Andrew Carruthers Coaching. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like I wanted something that spoke more to... Uh, what I actually do. And my personal belief, Ronit, is that we you know, learn the most through and um, taking the journey for ourselves. Mentoring is great, teaching is great, but really uh, where, uh, where change happens and I think also where embodiment of uh, information happens is by going through the journey for ourselves. So that is what spawned the title of the journey is for the company. Thank you for that, for clarification. Um, you know, we share so many great things, you and I together. Uh, mm -hmm. You were born in the, in the Northeast and I wasn't born in the Northeast, but I lived there for 27 years. Right. And recently we moved to the West Coast and you took uh, your journey and you moved to the West Coast. Um, so there's a lot of great similarities. You've been an educator for so long, uh, and you chose that path. You chose to be an educator. You had an amazing, and you still have an amazing, amazing, uh, career. You, you started as apprentice. Um, you became, uh, a platform artist. You created an amazing styles and amazing looks. You owned your own salon. Um, you, you were an, uh, Part of the education team for Paul Mitchell Schools, you, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're a director of education for Sam Villa's brand. You are a brand. You are a teacher, a coach. Uh, how how did you create that journey? Did you know right from the beginning that that's where you want to be at? Was it the natural evolution? Um, how did you, did you know what you wanted to do when you were uh, a stylist? Well, kind of all, all the above, I guess. There's kind of a lot of answers to that question because on some level, yes, there was a, a part of me that definitely had some things that it were inside of me. I felt like, yeah, I want to do these things. But there was also a big part of me that just was kind of open for the ride. I think that kind of speaks to that thought process of the journeyist. Sometimes we we don't know what that next step was or that next step is. 
and I, I think that that's part of being very open to something like a journey is that we kind of start with, okay, well, here's the next destination. Like here's that next benchmark that I want to meet, but always kind of keeping our eyes out in different directions to see what, what the potential is. And so one of the first things that happened to me, Ronit, is when I started to apprentice with this guy, Tyson, he he was, I think he was the regional education director for TG, the product line. And he he was like, well, I need people to go out and start teaching um, product knowledge classes for TG. And at this point, I I had barely even done much hair. Like, I, you know, I'd done a couple blow dries and shampoos, but I wasn't necessarily <laughs> a hairdresser. But he was like, hey, I'll teach you everything you need to know. You just go into salons and you do these classes where it's like, okay, well, here's the shampoo. It has vitamin A, C, and E, and it's great for color. It's like, that's all you have to do. And I had never pictured myself as a teacher. I didn't necessarily have great relationships with my teachers in the school or anything like that. So uh, never pictured myself being a teacher, but I just was like, yeah, sure. Let's try this out. Let's check it. But, you know, let's see how this goes. And after my first class that I taught, I was just totally hooked because it was like, wow, all I did was talk about TGE hair product, but People were super stoked and had a great time and had fun and learned something. I'm like, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. So that did start to guide my my thought process. And then when I saw Tyson like up on stage teaching and doing those kind of things, especially because you know I'm a failed rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love to talk about music too with you um, and and your other hobbits. But you know it's it's nice to hear that. Um, for change, actually, that in order to become a teacher, you don't have to master life, uh, the world, right? Because no. uh, let's think about a teachers when they go to school to become to university to become a good teacher, they didn't have an experience of becoming a teacher, right? If I'm right. thinking about myself from being a soldier, right? I've been in the soldier right. and in a training ground. I've been in training ground for uh, six months. But it was training for me to become a certain specific soldier. But then I was an instructor and a guide for people who did 40 years or 30 years or 20 years um, already in the practice. And I was their guide, you know. Right. So um, what is the difference? Um, you know, why do we always think that we need to master the world to become a very good coach? I mean, in your, in your salon. You are a mentor in the in the school. You're a mentor. You're a coach. You're a guide. Mm -hmm. Our our job is to guide. So why do people have this thing in their mind that they have to have uh, a lifetime of experience to become a very good coach in their companies or yeah. you know? Well, I mean, I think be, for the same reason that we have many of our um, perceptions, which is that it's kind of what we're taught. We're taught that. To um, to have um, the kind of clout, we have to have so much time. We have to have so much training. Now, you know that this is a great this is a great thing to bring up because I I had a young hairdresser um, contact me, and she was like, "Okay, my boss wants me to take on this job as being kind of like the the educator for the salon." And I'm one of the youngest people in the salon. And I'm like, well, why do you think that they chose you? And she's like, well, you know, I'm, I am really into education. I'm really passionate about hair. Like I'm someone that definitely shows up to work every day on time. And, you know, I put in my, you know, kind of put in my dues. And I was like, okay, so he had a, the, the owner had a good reason for asking you to be that position. So what are you concerned about? She's like, well, I don't know as much as some of the other hairdressers. I don't have as much experience as they do. So what do I have to teach them? It's mm -hmm. like their challenge. You're concerned about owning information that then you can deliver. Being in a, in a position of leadership, especially when it comes to coaching, uh, education, something like that, you don't have to own the information become the facilitator of the experience. So mm -hmm. 
my suggestion to her was be very upfront. That first class, sit down with them. Don't stand in front of the classroom. Sit down with them and say, you know, guys, I'm really humbled to be been given this position. But I know that I'm not the one that has the information to distribute to, to you because there's so much great talent already in this room. So what I'd like to do is just ask your permission to be the facilitator for us to learn together. And what you do is you bring them into, um, into the relationship. You bring them into the conversation. And this is a huge myth with coaching because people think I'm going to hire a coach so they can tell me what to do. <laughs> that's not <laughs> no. Right. no, that's consulting. The belief of a professional coach is that everything you need is inside of you. A professional coach is trained to uh, support you to find that yourself and to help hold you accountable. So I always tell people, and this is kind of a challenge in my coaching journey that I probably have to refine my focus a little bit. But I tell people, you can hire me to be your coach on anything because I don't have to have even the tiniest bit of expertise on it. I definitely have no place in rocket science. I don't have any understanding of rocket science, but I know that I could coach a rocket scientist to be a better rocket scientist because they're I the owner that. of the content, they're the owner of the information. I'm just there to support them. So um, I think this is a great topic actually, because I think there's a lot of young people out there that probably are getting opportunities that they don't feel ready for. And you don't necessarily, again, you don't have to be the expert. You just become the facilitator to the discovery process. And yeah. by the way, even if you are the most experienced person in the salon, even if you are the most knowledgeable people person in the salon, even if you're put in a place to be the teacher, part of your responsibility, yes, is to share your experience, but you're going to get more mileage if you enroll Absolutely. those students in the process. Yeah. Just standing well, the up there is- talking and sharing, that's, that's not great teaching. Exactly. I, I, you know, and the thing is, listen, you're not always going to be, you know, born with, with already the knowledge that you have 10 years from now. So, right. but, but hey, the more you put position yourself, if you want to teach, and the more you put position, you position yourself as a teacher, even though you don't know the information, the better leader you'll become, the better leader you'll become. So, so if we're looking at stylists and your uh, stylist of today, there's a in in it, the difference in stylists of 20 years ago. You and I probably uh, went through the the normal way of apprenticeship. For me, it was two years. Um, and and by the end of the two years, I learned how to shampoo better, uh, how to do things that I wasn't ready to to cut. Uh, but yet, I my ambitions was so high. I really wanted to know. But I didn't know, am I ready? Am I not ready? Should I go? How do you, as, as an educator in your salon or, uh, or as a mentor and a guide and a coach in your salon, technically, but also spiritually, when do you know that your stylist is ready? Or when does the stylist should trust themselves to say, enough with this, I'm going? <laughs> you know, when do you do that? How do you recognize that? And how do you cut the cord? So um, this is another really interesting question because when I was a partner in my salon, we had very specific parameters set up. We had very specific systems in place. I think systems are great for a purpose. (laughs) I think systems can also be very challenging because I think sometimes systems take away our intuition. What Mm -hmm. I mean by that is looking back, there were certain systems, there were certain benchmarks, there were certain qualifications that we held people to so strongly. And I look back and I'm not sure that that was always the best decision 
because my intuition was telling me something different. And looking back, I, I kind of wish that I would have trusted the intuitive sense, intuitive side of me more because systems are great because they create guidelines, they create benchmarks, they create some type of framework for us to work inside of. I think where they kind of get challenging or need is uh, if, if we're so driven by just the number, just the percentage, just the uh, framework, we miss that kind of spiritual connection. We miss that intuitive connection. We miss the emotional intelligence that our body has. So um, looking back, that probably would have been the big thing is with apprentices and with uh, leveling up to the next stylist level of things like that, definitely have your systems in place because that creates clarity. It creates clear benchmarks, but also create a practice of tapping into that intuitive portion of you so that you're utilizing all aspects, not just the analytical brains, but you're also using that compassionate emotional intelligence that you have and also that really deep intuitive sense too. In your opinion, um, if, if I was a salon owner too that needed to redesign uh, based on today's world, right? Mm -hmm. If I needed to redesign my education investment for my students, for my uh, staff, uh, obviously there's the new talent side <clears throat> and then there's the advanced side. We all need an inspiration and we all need some sort of uh, advancement. If you could create, and time wasn't an issue, and money wasn't an issue with all your knowledge of being the other side and as an educator, uh, as a director of education, being around so many students with different levels of learning, what do you think, if you could offer suggestions to our audience, mm -hmm. what would be the best way to uh, implement an education system for new talent? Yeah. For new talent specifically, if if you're kind of starting, um, I guess it'd be kind of two answers, Ronnie. On one side, if you're starting fresh, if you're creating a whole new program, I would be reaching out to other people that have successful programs and find out what they're doing to be successful. If you already have a program that people have gone through, that's where I would start talking to the people that have gone through the program and enroll them into the process of the re redesign and redevelopment of the process. Because you're seeing your, you are seeing that process from one side. You're seeing it from the ownership. You're seeing it from the management. You're probably not seeing it from the learner side is clearly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you do put yourself in the seat of the learner. But it's super important to enroll that person into the conversation so you can see it from their side too. So if I was redeveloping a system, I'd be going to my stylist that went through the system and say, okay, what, what parts of your experience were awesome? Tell me about like the two or three things that you felt worked super, super well that we should continue to focus on. And then ask, what are the two or three things that maybe didn't go so well? What what things would you see that we could really improve to build upon our strengths to make to make the best stylus possible? And by the way, if they're not willing to give you that feedback up front, you can create anonymous surveys. You can do things like that so they feel more open to giving you that feedback. But I it's it's hard to say that there's anything specific, Ronit, that I would I would say, well, you have to do this, you have to do this, because mm -hmm. I think each place is so individual. And again, that's where I think sometimes systems can get a little bit challenging because if you're just kind of handed the the textbook, like here's what you do, here's how you train your staff, it does take a little bit of, away from the fact of, well, you're in your own neighborhood, you're mm -hmm. in your own space, you're in with your mm -hmm. own group of people. And what one salon does down the street 
isn't going to work for the salon up the street. Can, mm-hmm. can you learn from each other? Could you still work from maybe like the same basic program? Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Like there's certain things like Roni, you could talk, talk to us all day long about the things that are 100% concrete, you know, your profit and loss statements, things like that. There's really no negotiating with that. Like those things yeah. have to be concrete. But as far as exactly how you run an education program, I think there are some baselines. Yeah. But I think building a team where they can feel like they are enrolled uh, in that process, that's key. Oh, I love that. So you basically can do um, a mastermind style yeah, of education perfect. and ask and ask your veterans uh, or ask your uh, uh, staff that is going in the process, maybe, and this is something that just comes to my mind because we do this with our clients. Uh, mm-hmm. Whenever we roll a new program, we do a beta program. And right. we ask anybody out there who would like to be in a beta program. It's, uh, you know, so we ha- always have volunteers. And what we do is we, they share their feedback so we can better our program. Uh, and I love that. I, I would love to suggest it to everybody. Uh, you know, what Andrew is saying here is that create engagement within your students so they can be part of the equation so they can improve your program. Now, Andrew, um, you know, going back, I, I, I was li- I'm listening to all uh, the older community, the, the, the professional community, you know, our age and above. Uh, we've all, everybody says the higher standard, the more you put yourself into higher standard of learning and the more you want to learn from the best, to be the best, uh, the better you'll become, the better you'll become. And um, and they say the old fashioned way, minimum of learning is a year into it. And um, you really have to, to, to be at a certain level so good before you get on the floor, right? But yeah. these days we have a big challenge as salon owners. Most of our competition uh, for staff and recruitment is because um, what they share, a stylist share that if they could have had a faster way of learning and get on the floor faster, they they would prefer that. And that's why they move from one place to another. They really are hungry to learn. I mean, we have shitload on, on YouTube, so they can learn so much on YouTube, but there's some things obviously they cannot learn. So. Sure. My question for you, and what, what do you think? Because I'd love to know your opinion. Is it possible to create an academy, for example, of doing five days of, of uh, intensive, five days learning, and then maybe support it once a week with, with support of, of whatever you learned in the five years, but then at some point, sooner than later, have some sort of an introduction to the floor? Maybe in the beginning they don't get introduction to the floor with with um, with cutting, maybe with color, maybe with blow drying or something. Sure. But yet, you know, what do you think? Does that sound like it could happen? Can we do this? So, um, the way that we did it at Lunatic Fringe, the the company that I worked with my whole career, we uh, you came in as an apprentice. Everyone came through the education program, but as soon as you started you had time at the chair and you were required to get people in right off the bat because that is just as much of a skill set as this this is the product we create but skill set wise creating a business is just as important so you know basically what we what we had an agreement with was that when people first started, they had time on the books and then they had their training time, they had their support time. During the time that they were doing hair roni, what we did is, of course, because we don't have enough experience with you yet, we can't give you walk-ins because that's our reputation. Mm -hmm. So until we start to see your work quality, your work ethic, we're not gonna necessarily get you walk-ins yet. But what we ask you to do is these couple hours each week, we expect you to start to get those filled with clients that you bring in for yourself. So um, part of what we're also instilling them, instilling in them at that point is don't get reliant on the salon for walk-ins. Do the work to create your business for yourself. 
Got it. Because that's essential, right? Like, yes. we can't rely on the front desk to create our business for us. For me personally, I wouldn't do it any other way. I've definitely yeah. heard of people doing like, okay, you come out of school, you do a three month apprenticeship, six month apprenticeship, one year apprenticeship. And during that time, I, I think that I'm sure that there are people that would go through that year apprenticeship and not lose their steam, not lose that like kind of gusto for clientele. But I think there's a huge portion of people that will. So I, to me, it makes sense. Uh, the training and the time and the experience on the floor should happen. And here's the thing, Ronnie. What are people afraid of when with letting young people do hair on the floor? They're afraid that they're not going to do a good job and that they're going to hurt exactly. the reputation on all those yes. things. So, so again, they want to study more. So they want to study more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I love that. I love they, that. They need you a know? chance to screw up too. That's yes. the thing. And like, that's where you're supporting them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got it. I love that. I love that. So, um, so anybody who is listening or just coming into the show, I just wanted to refresh everybody and let let everybody know that you're right here at Huddle Time with Ronit, and we have an an amazing guest, Andrew Carruthers, who is uh, sharing with us. What does it take um, to be a good educator, a good coach, a good mentor? Uh, and for all of us who are in this business and we are, uh, you know, mentors, salon owners, business owners, we, we consider ourselves as a CEO and as executive. Um, Andrew is going to be speaking very soon about his technique of what does it take to really get us confidence and, and, and more so. So if we can transition into the next topic really mm -hmm. is uh is i would love to talk about your way of coaching you obviously develop a very unique way of coaching and a very unique way of educating through all these years of being a, such a great teacher um but you have a different approach to coaching or a different coach mm -hmm. to life journey or business journey um what is so unique to your methodology and who do you love working with good question so um, the the unique quality is definitely just it's me taking um so many things from all of my teachers all of my mentors all the education that i've taken so far over the last well, 21 years, because even with my life coaching clients, there's so much of what I learned, even as a hairdresser infused in life coaching, even if they're not a hairdresser. But <clears throat> originally, I was kind of taught a pretty traditional sort of coaching process. But as my teacher and mentor, she she started to progress and start to open up to new techniques and new processes. Of course, she introduced me to those too. The one that really spoke to me so much was this thing called multiple brain integration techniques. Because I I really like running when um, the esoteric things that we have been taught over the years start to meet up and almost get proven by neuroscience. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of that happen, especially with, I mean, there is so much information about how valuable um, meditation is through uh, proof through neuroscience now. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've always said and we've always kind of known is that we have intelligence in our body that's not just analytical because we've said these things out loud. And I know all of you out there that are watching have said things like, well, my heart is really telling me this, or I get a gut feeling that dot, dot, dot. Those things are true. <laughs> so through <laughs> science now, what we've discovered is that the heart and the gut actually have the exact same structures within them that this thing does, the head brain. What's really interesting that has been um, a discovery within the last handful of years, Ronnie, is that 
most of the communication between the heart and the gut is efferent, meaning that the information is going upwards. So a signal actually start here, or a signal starts in the gut, then it's going to the head brain to be processed. There's much more information going from the heart and the gut up to the head, opposite direction. So um, the coaching method of MBIT, multiple brain integration techniques, is to open up those channels and to reintegrate that kind of intelligence into the body. Because the more integrated we are, then of course, the more wise we can be as in our decision-making processes. And that's the whole principle of MBIT is to um, get us to a place that we can make the wisest decisions possible to um, help to benefit our community. So it starts with a process of coherence because everyone knows that our nervous system can be very activated or it can be very down. When we're in a really heightened response position, that's when we make snap judgments, we make emotional decisions that don't have backing from our intuitive side or our analytical side. There's lots of things that happen if we're too highly um, kind of energized. But we also know we don't think very well when we're just super relaxed and super chilled out, right? <laughs> so yeah. we start by getting the autonomic nervous system into a state of coherence through uh, breathing. Then we start to uh, connect the intelligence of the heart, the gut, the head brain together to, to get things into a more integrated space. Then we look for some type of wisdom between the three then we hold each other then we hold uh, ourselves accountable to those things and i love i love that you're you're speaking about the gut and um mm -hmm. and the heart uh we're talking on on emotional uh elements the gut obviously and the heart the nerve system um sometimes you know uh when you think about the gut you're not thinking about well what do you mean the gut is just to digest but right. no no it's it's your 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 other brain you know in, in a, as a matter of fact it's your emotional brain so um like you said there's a lot that goes from the heart and from the gut because as a as executive as a ceo as a business owner um you not really speaking with your brain mm -hmm. your brain is actually moving you towards what your gut and your heart want. So you have to have the emotional connection between and the integration that you're talking about to, to the brain. The brain is just a vehicle. It's just yeah. a, a bus, right? You are the driver and you're using your gut and your heart. So um, when you do the uh, multiple integration of, yeah. of your three elements, um, how do you, it's not actually how, it's like what result do you get uh, when you're working? Uh, let's say with even with myself, right? If I wanted to get more coaching. So I, you know, as you know, Andrew, we are a training and coaching company and we work with business owners and executives, making them uh, more profitable and, and wealthy in their life. But I don't remember Ronit without having a therapist, a coach, a mentor, a coach. So for me, I cannot wait to have integration uh, session with you. But yeah. I'm curious, right? When you said to me, we, we have to work on uh, on your three elements, uh, I can't wait to get into the session with you. So as an executive, as somebody who is building a company, who wants to build a better company, who wants to take a thousand salon owners and transfer their life, how can you help me become better at what I do? So um, through the process of integration, one, one of the things that's a, a belief within our coaching system is that wisdom is em emergent. So what we mean by wisdom is emergent is that things don't necessarily just all of a sudden pop up and, they, and it's like, oh yeah, that's the wisest decision I could possibly make which is really often what we're looking for in a coaching session. It's like, well, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And it's always interesting, Ronnie, because through the process, 
one of the first things we do, even before we start to do our um, our um, balance breathing to get into a coherent state, is we do a little check-in. So the first thing I'd do with you, Ronit, is I'd say, okay, well, let's talk. Like, what's the most important thing that you'd like to kind of talk about today? Or what's the most important thing that you'd like to get some clarity around today? And that could be as simple as, well, it just kind of, I need to fire out, figure out if I need to fire this person or not, or it could be um, need to figure out what this new coaching system work looks like. So um, at that point, we would set up where the person is currently at within that decision, where they want to get to, and what are the things that are in between, what's stopping them from getting to that point they want to get to. Then we'd start to go into the coherent breathing, then we'd start to ask the heart specifically, like, we'll literally have a conversation. I'll ask you, you know, if you tap in deep into that compassionate space within the heart, what's it telling you about this situation? What's the message that is bringing forward for you? And we can explore that. And we might even ask about what it's feeling, what it's sensing. Sometimes even just random stuff comes up like a color. Some, especially when we're talking about the gut brain, when we go down deep into that place, and it's funny because you said it's not just a place for digestion, it digests food, but it also digests information. A lot of times when you say, you know, I need some time to chew on that, I need some time to digest that, what you're mm -hmm. saying is that there's some kind of truth there. What mm -hmm. you need to do is now integrate it into your body. You need to make meaning of it. And the gut brain is very much where we make something from, we take it from just like, oh yeah, that's a great idea to becoming more integrated as a part of who we are. And so that's a lot of the conversation that'll come up with the gut brain. And sometimes what'll happen is someone will be like, I, I just got this funny taste in my mouth because the entire enteric system starts with the mouth and goes all yeah. the way to the end result, which we all know what that is, but that is all part of that enteric system. So it's really interesting. Like things come up. And the reason we say that wisdom is emergent is half the time, Roni, the thing we started the discussion on isn't the thing we finish on. So mm. the discussion might start, you know, I've really got to, I got to think about whether I'm going to let this person go from my staff or not. By the end, a lot of times what it is is, wow. Right. I need, I need to find a different path of compassion with my staff. Mm. Like it yeah. really had nothing to do about firing someone and it had to do with their personal connection with staff. And so that's where I think the ambit comes in with kind of like business kind of coaching. It has nothing to yeah. do with finances or anything like that, but it definitely helps with clarity I think it be it also makes for a much more holistic business owner. Absolutely, and I love that you bring it to to actually um, what you were talking. There's there's a taste in your mouth, and and it's true. You know when you're when you're fearing, and this is what brings us into uh, our topic of fear. Uh, there's a lot of fears. Uh, today we had a great session. Uh, of, of, of training and coaching in Salon Cadence, which are community group. And we talked about how do we keep the momentum? We're exhausted, we're tired as, as executive, as Salon or as a CEO. And, um, and when I asked one of our customers, I asked, uh, I, I said to her, do you think you're the only one? Yeah. And I said to her, you know, executives of Google, uh, Apple, they all, if you listen to their stories, they all will tell you that they go through depression. They all, mm -hmm. some of them have bipolar. Um, they have other condition. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough game to play, to be responsible in other people's lives and to want the life that you want. So the fear factor comes into play. Uh, and it needs, we need to teach ourselves how to use the fear, because it's okay to have fear, how to use the fear and how not to let it affect our brain and what we need to do next, because we want to move forward. We just don't want to be stagnant or compliances or anything, because that's the worst case scenario. So 
uh, how do you keep momentum? Uh, and, and Andrew, we talked about it a few times, you know, to be excited and inspire uh, as a teacher, because all of us executive and CEO, we are. We, we're here to lead and we're here to empower others to become independent. Mm -hmm. So how do we conquer it with our gut? Uh, obviously, uh, you know, if anybody booked a session with you, they will have to do it as a practice. You know, this is not like an overnight thing, but um, practicing a methodology or practicing breathing, what, you know, and, and, I, and I know I'm asking this question in so many different ways because I'm so passionate about it, but, you know, we're, we're, we're worried. We have a worriesome. And uh, of of not being successful and not getting the things that we want, and we're in this again and again, and we're fearing that we're fearing that. Yeah. So you know, I feel like without a coach to navigate you through it, you're alone. You're alone in this battle, and it's very difficult. But your your way of working is working with three elements yeah. to navigate fear. Uh, what are the three things that you can suggest that you do with your clients that helps us move forward? Yeah. Well, one of the first things is to recognize that um, no emotion is good or bad. It's just emotion. We place the label of, well, this is a good emotion because it's comfortable, or this is a bad emotion because it's uncomfortable. Fear is the, one of the most healthy responses that we have because it helps us to respond. And what a perfect day to talk about this beautiful woman. Um, I've taken a, some classes from this Mescalero Apache medicine woman. Her name is Billy Topatate. Today is Indigenous People Day. So um, happy Indigenous People Day to Billy Topatate. <laughs> She, uh, she was talking to us about animal medicine. And one of the things that stood out so much is when she was talking about the deer. Because the deer is very responsive. They're highly alert. But their ability to go from fear response back to a natural state of peacefulness is really incredible and amazing. So um, you guys can watch this because almost no matter where you live in the world, you can probably find some deer to watch. So if you watch, they're always monitoring. Like their ears are always kind of like turning and twitching and like all this stuff. Even when they're just super peaceful and they're just eating grass, they're always alert. And then all of a sudden, they'll pop up. They might even run. They might even like jump a little ways and run. Then they'll look around and be like, oh, okay, I'm fine. And then they just go right back to this peaceful space of grazing on some grass. Humans, we have gotten to a place where we are not good with this. Once we're up in that fear response, we tend to kind of like want to stay up in that heightened fear response because it feels like okay, well, there's something happening here, so I have to stay on the high alert and I have to stay in this fear response to work with that. So I think the first thing is to recognize that fear response is incredibly healthy as long as you can also then return yourself to a more mm -hmm. coherent space. So the first thing is just recognizing that fear is totally fine. And a lot of times, mm -hmm. honestly, Ronnie, during a coaching session, when we tap into something like the heart or like the gut brain, if people haven't been comfortable with those spaces, it brings up a little bit of fear response. They'll go, oh man, like when I tapped into my heart, like I kind of felt a little tightening, like it kind of uh, held back from me. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times it's just, okay, we'll stay present to it. Try your best not to make any judgment don't try to make any reason from it. Just stay present with that sensation that's sitting there. So one of the first things you can do as soon as you find yourself in that fear response, do not try to run from it. Do not try and hide from it. Actually embrace it and treat it as the friend that it is to you because it's mm -hmm. trying to tell you something. 
you may find as soon as you actually turn towards it and say, ah, okay, I'm, I'm, there's fear present within me, which is a good little trick, by the way, instead of saying, I am afraid, say fear yeah. is present. There's the, yeah. Yeah. Because it changes the, it changes the experience a bit. And as soon as you do it, and if you could just sit there and say, okay, fear, what do you have for me today? What, what sense do I need to pay attention to? What do I need today? When you do that, something happens and it changes the experience. So um, that's kind of one of the first things we need is just stop judging fear as this horrible, nasty thing that we're not supposed to experience because it 100% is. When I'm, I know that I'm saying something that is not comfortable for people. I know, but it's one of the best things you can do. The yeah. second thing is to uh, start to learn to breathe better because you'll notice as soon as you go into that heightened response, two things will happen. Your breath will shorten and it will become shallow. So all of a sudden you're gonna be breathing up here in your chest, your shoulders will get tight. And as soon as you get that energy, like you're gonna to start to feel like you can't breathe deeply down into your belly anymore. And the breath is going to get very, very short. So instead of having a nice like five to six second breath in, nice five to six second breath out, all of a sudden you're gonna be <laughs> The great thing is you can actually utilize the breath too to help to change that. So when you start to feel that heightened anxiety, just come back to your breath and just slow it down. See if you can start to feel it deeper into the body, start to feel the body breathe again instead of just up here in the chest. And a lot of times that helps it neutralize that space and get you coherent again. What we found through um, <clears throat> research and that there's um, there's a great website called coherentbreathing.com. Okay. But he, he has really, um, I think he has the best studies on uh, coherence. And he says somewhere in the, the realm of five to six seconds in and five to six seconds out, that balance of those two, that's where he tends to see people fall into the highest state of coherence. And for some people, if you are not comfortable with breathing just yeah. in general, <laughs> that might start to feel like a lot. So just start with even pace in, even pace out, whatever it is. If it's three seconds in, three seconds out for you, just do that. Yeah, uh, I think I think that um, listening to what you're saying, it's something that uh, we all have to learn how to do. We all have to learn how to breathe correctly. Uh, you know, there's so many ways of breathing and breathing sessions, and there's a lot of uh, opportunity to learn how to. But if we can make a change, right, one or two changes um, in a stylist anxiety, so from a stylist point of view, from, mm -hmm. from a, a, you know, if you're a, a licensed beautician, whether you're in the spa world, whether you're in the nail world, whether you're in the hair world, whether you want to be a platform artist, you know, there's always going to be the worry, the fear, the anxiety, am I good enough? And I'd be able to get there. So in order to get from one place to another, you will always going to have to grow, right? Get out of the comfort yes. zone. But um, what are the two things that you can offer a stylist on an everyday uh, practice to do and to learn to become better at? that will completely change your life. And maybe even you'll be able to control your fear better. What would those two things for a stylist be? I think the first thing is just kind of what we talked about is to um, honestly try to kind of befriend that sense of fear. Because the fear centers in our body, they don't necessarily know the difference between good change and bad change. They just respond to change. So even if it's positive change that you're trying to make, and this is why a lot of people have a hard time with, uh, with meeting their goals, is if you're trying to change something about who you are, what you do, the body's natural reaction is to say, wait a second, this is different. This might be scary. So it kind of turns on the internal alarm bells. 
So we have to start to befriend that sense as, okay, that's cool. Like, yeah, I'm doing something great. I'm working hard. I'm making this change that's going to be fantastic in my life. We have to recognize that the body will turn on the mm -hmm. alarm bell system. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think just recognizing that, Roni, is yeah. kind of like the yeah. first thing. I think that will help tremendously. Mm -hmm. Number two, stop trying to do it all yourself. Because love I, it. Love a huge it. myth. What do you mean? What do you mean? Stop doing it? No, no, no. Tell me more details. What do you mean stop doing it by yourself? What, what are the things that they mm -hmm. should ask for help? Because asking for help, I think, is so important. So what are the things that you don't have to do by yourself? Anything. I mean, honestly, you know, to me, I think one of the things that we've learned this last six months, Roni, is that yes. community is essential. We yes. have to have community. There's yes. this myth out there that like, well, if you can't do it yourself, then you're weak. That's such crap. Such because crap. if anything has happened in the last six months, the proof of how much we need each other and how yes. much we need community and how much we need connection and stop thinking of it as asking for help. It's asking for community. It's asking for connection. It's asking for yeah. um, like this reciprocal exchange. It's not yeah. about, hey, I'm weak, I need your help. It's, I'm a human and I work better in community. Yeah. That's what it is. That is, so important guys when you're together and you're sharing fear together and your common your common worries it, you're suddenly not afraid anymore you're all together so uh you know and, and i will share with you you know when i started doing uh huddle time with ronit um i didn't know what stream live i didn't know what facebook live is i was afraid about uh how am i going to look on camera what people yeah. will think of me. My English is very different than most people. Uh, are they gonna like me? Let me, let me, and so the beginning I was like, well, let me try to be who I am not. Let me try to see what Andrew does. Let me try to do what this does. I, you know, the imposter syndrome just came to me all the time. And finally I said, you know what, screw all this. I'm here to do one thing. My goal is to enjoy what I'm doing and to help you with your career and with your destiny. That's, that's my goal. But more than anything, I ask for help. Yeah. I ask you to be on this show. You ask me to be on yours. Yeah. Um, we're here making love right now to this camera for you guys. <laughs> you, can, you know what I mean? Because you guys can benefit from this. I'm learning so much from you and just from this session. Um, and if you can be transparent and you can say, I need help, you know, here are the things that I need help. Can you teach me? Can you help me? Then you going guys to advance like nothing else and you wanna create a community that is stronger. And that's what Andrew is trying to tell you guys. You know, it is the fear will always be fear. But how are you reacting to it with your gut, with your brain, with your um, breathing is, is what's going to get you past that fear past that fear so ask questions yes. what would you say the same thing goes for executives oh 100 percent. more so right oh absolutely because i i think that i can speak for myself when i was in that position of ownership i had co-owners but even within our co-ownership i still had this sense that like why well, I, I have this responsibility i have to make this work i have to do everything myself and the thing is, is like you have to get past that because that is, it's going to do two things. It's going to make you feel stressed as hell and completely isolated, but it's also going to put your staff in a position to not trust you. Mm. Because if, if they see you trying to own everything and take care of everything, they don't see it as noble. Mm -hmm. They don't see it as, oh, they're such a hard worker. They love us so much that they give up every ounce of their day and they control everything. They go, wow, they don't trust me. So oh, that's very strong. Them. That's a very good point. Many salon owners are worried 
that t- transition between uh, being behind the chair and becoming the leader of the company, especially we're talking with, with so many salon owners, mm-hmm. that they're going to disappoint their staff, but not being the worker bee and inside the business all the time. But they're so wrong because the staff want you out out they don't want you in anymore they want you to allow them to deliver yes to be the to be the next genius right um oh my god that is so true andrew so maybe what we need to do andrew is get a breathing session exercise i I see bill is on the call and bill says i want to spend time learning from andrew you got it bill (laughs) <laughs> and I think I think we we should have uh, some really good practice with with Andrew mm-hmm. on just doing breathing exercises. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, done. Say 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 the day, say the time. We're going to be doing that. Uh, um, okay, so just to wrap up our our conversation for today, guys. Um, you know, highlighting Andrew and saying, Andrew, you're such um, an educator, you're such a teacher, you've always been uh, supporting other people to grow, you're guiding other people to grow. What is next on Andrew's Hmm. career path? Well, much more coaching. Because I'm um, currently in, I mean, a next level mentorship with the multiple brain integration group. So um, lots more coaching. I should have my website, my new website launch next week. So um, that is exciting. Yeah. It'll be a great place that I can actually start to create some resources. Yeah. But, you know, I'm kind of in a space, Roni, that I'm kind of like I said earlier, I'm just kind of... I feel the journey is there's something so strong happening at the moment. And so I'm kind of just waiting for the next stone to appear to the river crossing. Like when Michelle and I moved here to um, uh, Oregon, we had no idea how we were going to make it work. In fact, it it looked like it shouldn't work financially. (laughs) everything. It looked like it shouldn't work. But there was something that we just felt inside of us that was like, this is the right thing. Like we, we need to make this move. So um, I just started to trust. I was like, okay, one step after the next. So um, took a step and we could see across the river that looked like there was no bridge to the, the river on the other side. We could see the point that we wanted to get to but we had no, no path. But as soon as I'd take a step, I just stand there. All of a sudden, another rock would, would appear in the water. It's like, Oh, there's another step. And then, Oh, Oh my gosh, there's another step right there. Okay. Let's Mm -hmm. take that step. And so that's kind of where I feel like I'm at in the same, same realm. It's like, I can kind of see the other side of the river right now. And then there's something really beautiful over there. I can't quite see it. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm just kind of waiting for those stones to appear. Yeah. And as they do, I'm going to use that intuitive part of me to say, yeah, that's the next stone stone in the river. Well, in the meantime, for everybody, um, there's there's three sessions with Andrew every week on Sam Vi- with Sam Villa's uh, oh. platform, um, and that you can watch every week. Uh, but uh, you can watch his coaching and his wonderful guests uh, at Wellness Wednesday. And that's at 6 p.m. Uh, is it 6 p.m.? It's 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Okay. So 4 p.m. Pacific. And um, But if you're interested to even just have a conversation or discovery uh, session um, with Andrew, uh, Andrew will have his website up next week and you're going to have all the information right here on the links, which is great. Is there anything you want to leave us with, Andrew? Um, you know, Ronit, I, I think the biggest thing right now is to recognize that there's a lot of messages going around that we're broken in some way. 
And if there's something I could leave you with is you're not broken. Our society is not broken. Our world is not broken. Are there things that we need to do to change, to grow? Yeah, 100%. But we're not broken. No. So um, see yourself as the whole. See yourself as the perfectly uh, capable. And at this point in your life, the same opportunities exist today that have always existed for you. Sure, we're going through some challenges, but that doesn't change the fact that from a universal perspective, there's just much is just as much potential today as any other moment in your life. So, yeah. Just know that you are whole. Just know that you are capable. Just know that you have every opportunity in front of you. And hold that as your belief. Absolutely. And if you could also add to it, surround yourself with people that mm -hmm. always elevate you. Always elevate. If you have somebody around you that doesn't really believe you so much or or hold you down instead of hold you up, just clean it up, get rid of it and, and, and spend your time with people because really seriously, we don't have the time to not spend people that only elevate with us. So that's the truth. Well, great, great, Andrew. Thank you so much for such a, such a great uh, session. And for everybody who has been coming in and tuning in, obviously this is going to be uh, continue being on American's beauty show. Um, for anybody who uh, is not a member yet at American's Beauty Show, we are, we are right now uh, launching our new web website, Cosmetology of Chicago, American's Beauty Show. We're so super excited about that. It's coming mm -hmm. with so many phenomenal events. And we're starting with the beauty brunch for women uh, in beauty. And we're going to have some great people uh, on the events. So tune in. And uh, we'll see you on Monday next week. And we're going to have uh, a phenomenal writer coach. And we're going to be talking with Allison, who is going to share with us the beauty of writing and how writing can make you even a better leader and how writing can even make you uh, more uh, mindful about your goal and crystal clear. So tune in next week. Andrew, I love you. Much love, love to you. you. And see you uh, see you next time. Yes. Thank Bye you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Kalina. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Bill.